Hi, I'm Mark Madison, and the first of our Mission Wolf guests I'd like to introduce would be Kent Weber. Kent, welcome to the National Conservation thank Training you. Center, and, and thanks so much for coming here. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't we just bring our guest on out? That'd be great. And we've got a very special, very unusual guest. Her name's Magpie. Uh, she's a four-year-old Canadian gray wolf, and she's very healthy and strong, but she's got one problem. She was born in a cage with people, and we'll see if we can get Maggie to come on up. She does kind of what she wants. Well, how you doing, pretty girl? Welcome, Maggie and Tracy. And this is Maggie, and this is my wife, Tracy. Now, as you can see, Maggie's not afraid of us. She's very calm. She's very tame, but she's not trained. She right. does pretty much what she wants, when she wants. Um, but because she was born in a cage, she's stuck in a cage. Um, a lot of people uh, are liking nature, and even like with this show, to get a wolf onto TV, it's very difficult. Yeah. And a lot of people don't like the image of a wolf with people and a collar. So they go get a wolf out of a cage and they make a movie in a fenced area. Of course, you don't see the fence. Right. And then after the movie's over, they don't want the wolf. And that's how we ended up with Maggie. She's four years old. Um, she's right in the prime of her life. And uh, she hasn't been on too many sets like this. She's sitting here looking around, watching everything. But as long as she's willing, she's why we call her an ambassador. If she ever gets scared and is stressed by this, she can go back home to her sanctuary. How long has Maggie been an ambassador, Wolf? Uh, Maggie was rescued at the age of four months. She was adopted by one of the other wolves we have at a sanctuary. And what's unique about Maggie is she has a low flight reaction. Nothing that we did. We didn't right. treat her or teach her this. It's just some wolves, if a pine cone falls out of a tree, some wild animals, they jump up and they run 100 yards, and then they turn around and go, oh, it was a pine cone. Maggie's one of the few wolves that all of a sudden it drops, it hits the ground, and instead of running, she freezes. She turns around, oh, pine cone. Very low flight reaction. And so because her fear or flight reaction is very loud, she also has learned she gets to be center of attention. Um, you can see she's got no problem just standing here. I've got a little tiny treat in my pocket. I'm going to see if I can get her to stand up here on this stable in front of us. There we go. And hopefully we can get a pretty good sense to take a look at her. That was just a little treat of a hot dog. As you can see, wild animals are always looking for food. Yeah. And we usually don't use any food to condition her or train her, but it does help keep her attention sometimes. Sure. Just like my four-year-old at home. <laughs> yes. I use yep. snacks. <laughs> yep. If you want to make friends anywhere in life, food. Earlier you were talking um, out here about some of the physical characteristics that distinguish uh -huh. a, a wolf from a... Uh, Tracy. Right here. Um, yeah, I'll see if I can get her to come around between us. It'll okay. be a little bit easier. But um, today you have a lot of people, and this is just turkey. She's like, oh, I want some of that food. <laughs> yep. We're going to try to get around like in the front here. She likes the turkey more than the hot yep. dog? Um, it's all varied. Yeah, this is uh, food. Last night she ate a whole bunch of food, and you can see one. That's one of the differences between a wolf and a dog right here. She's always looking for food. Um, she's very strong. She can break the bones with her teeth. And yet, you can see how gentle she's being. I'm just yes. letting her have this food a little gently out of my hand. Now, we'll see if we can get her to stand up on this table. Okay. Can you come on up? we got to be a little patient here. There we go. Now, one of the things I can do is I can hold her chest and her elbows right together. Yeah. And you see how narrow this chest is. She's got a longer chest than a dog. Your head already is just enormous. Um, and probably the biggest difference between a wolf and a dog is right here. It's her brain. Um, she thinks for herself she has no need to make you or me happy. She only needs to take care of herself. Where domestic means they do what we want. Uh, right. We've taught dogs to do all kinds of things. Her way of greeting another wolf is instinctual, and it means I go sniff the other wolf right on the nose. To tell her not to sniff you on the nose like you would a dog would go against her instinct. It would be like trying to teach a child, don't ever hug. One of the things I want people to notice while she's up is look at the length of her tail. It yeah. stops right at her knees, where most coyotes have a longer tail. Uh, foxes have a real long one, and can you do a little song? Ooh. Sometimes she'll sit there, and she started howling when she first came in. Yep, I'm going to let her walk off that. As you can see, it's a little awkward for her to stand still. But, um, yeah, in a nutshell, there's about 20 differences between a wolf and a dog. The first thing you saw was her head. Her yellow eyes are slanted. She's got a flat profile on her nose. Again, the narrow elbows. She's got huge feet, web skin between her toes. Um, some dogs have web skin. Some dogs have a flat profile nose. Uh, some dogs have two layers of fur coat. It doesn't mean that they're part wolf. Um, and yet what we've learned through uh, DNA analysis is that all dogs are related to wolves, not coyotes, not foxes. Yeah. 
I can attest to her beautiful voice. I had a answered machine message from you guys with her howling in the background and I, I refused to erase it. <laughs> it was Nope, not gonna yep, she's just on the edge of thinking, and anytime we want her to do something, she makes a fool out of us. Um, that's what Wild is. They do what they want. Uh, but yes, when I was talking to you on the phone, she does this every morning at sunrise, she howls. Every day at sunset, she howls. And it's just like all of us, and there we go. Oh. And what it is, is kind of communication. She's like, where's the pack? This is unusual. We're standing still. Um, she has other members of the Wolf family back in Colorado that she would like to uh, probably request to come here. Now, we've never, ever had a wolf walk into a TV set and start howling on the camera. This is the first time. And uh, I think she likes your facility here. <laughs> She knows we're, we're the agency that helps yeah. restore her. <laughs> she said it's kind of <laughs> sad that Maggie has to live in a cage. And yet, because she lives in a cage, if she's scared, like most wolves in her sanctuary, they're far away from people. They give big enclosures. But because she's not afraid, she gets to go to schools. She's actually met 100,000 people. She's met politicians. She's been on TV shows and in magazines. And uh, I can tell you don't be afraid of wolves all day. But until you meet her, do you really believe me? Uh, yes. People have to see it with their own eyes. Do you think she likes meeting people? I mean, you guys are with her all the time. You travel with her, or is this just something she? Well, that tolerates? was something. You know, <laughs> at first, uh, I grew up in the woods, and I grew up in an area where you don't put animals in the house. And I thought it was really Ooh. sad, especially looking at it from the animal's viewpoint, to have to live in a cage. And I still agree with that because she was born in a cage. She can't ever run and hunt and live life like a wolf, and yet. She's going to live twice as long as a wild wolf. Yeah. She gets fed. She gets veterinary care. Uh, this wolf has already been to a main coast four times where she pees on the same rock each year we go out to that coast. She's also marked her territory on the Pacific Ocean. She, we would say, has the biggest territory of any wolf around. <laughs> and the so there are some benefits. Um, you can see her belly is just full. And even though she's got a full belly, she still uh, is always ready to eat. Um, that's another, that's probably the biggest difference between wild and domestic is wild's always looking for food. Now, if we could have had her to howl with all the employees or some of the school kids, that'd be great. But um, she does it on a set like this, just very individualistic. And this is unusual. Tracy and I are sitting here not doing anything. And she's like, this is really weird. This you know, is great. We should have mic'd her. Wolves, wolves don't sit around and talk like you and I are doing. Right. They do everything for a purpose. So when she came in here, she greeted us. She said hello. I don't need to sit around and be petted now. I'm going to go explore the studio. This is great. You started to talk a little about um, where the wolves are in, in your sanctuary outside uh, Gardner, Colorado. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, there. Mission Wolf, uh, it's a sanctuary for captive wolves. These are all wolves that were already born in a cage. We don't do any breeding. There's no reason to have a wolf in a cage except to teach people why wolves shouldn't be in cages. Um, and so the sanctuary was set up with one purpose, to give the wolves freedom from people. Huge enclosures far away from people so they can howl and do whatever wolves like to do and not bother humans, and yet they're still confined. Well, what we found is that nobody believes it until they experience it, and by having a wolf that's brave enough like Maggie to go travel, we go to audiences now that won't even go to their local nature center. To get them to come down to their local school gymnasium or the local museum, you've done a pretty good job. But that's what we're trying to do is reach out to people that nature is something we should all appreciate. Um, unfortunately, Americans are so afraid of nature, especially wolves. We killed virtually everyone in the wild. Right. Then we put some in cages. They kind of look like dogs, so we think we should have them as dogs. And today, it's tragic, Mark, but there's more wolves in cages than live in the wild. So that's what Mission Wolf is here to do, is teach people don't be afraid of wolves. They sure don't like to live in a cage. And right. someday, if we do our job right, we get to put Mission Wolf out of business, get wolves back in the wild, and not have them in cages. And so that's why we're out here today, is to talk about wolf recovery here in New England.
Well, let's talk a little about wolf recovery in New England. Yeah. We don't have any um, wild wolves left in this part of the country, although they would have been here originally. Yeah. Um, what are the opportunities for, for wolf well, restoration? Well, the U.S. Right Fish and Wildlife Service is in a, a unique position that they got assigned the task of restoring endangered populations across our country. And boy, with a political animal like the wolf, that is one of the hardest things to do. But uh, out west, it started with 22 years of political arguing, how do we get wolves to Yellowstone? Mm -hmm. Once they did it, it took one year, <laughs> and they got the wolves to Yellowstone. The wolves had so many elk to eat that now the wolves are doing fine. The the next thing that we started learning is that the elk for 70 years had eaten almost all the trees along the creeks. The aspens, the willows, and the cottonwoods completely browsed right to the nubs. And for 70 years, that meant the creeks were shriveling up. The grass was drying out. The elk had nothing chasing them, so they were getting a little fat and lazy and thus getting sick. Now that the wolves are back, the only thing different in Yellowstone with the wolves there is the elk can't stand still. And because the elk can't stand still, the trees are growing, the elk are getting strong, their hooves are aerating the ground, mm -hmm. more water's going in the grass, the grass is growing faster, and with the wolves chasing the elk and the trees growing, they now put more shadows on the grass so the fish get cold water because the wolf chases an elk. That is what we've learned in Yellowstone. We call it the trophic cascade. And we now have had, in 10 years, wolves recolonize 12 states. That's huge. We never would have believed that would have occurred 10 years ago. And we have wolves so many in the Rockies that now the Fish and Wildlife Service is almost out of a job out there. They're almost ready to go, hey, we got wolves back in the Rockies. But then some other folks in Oregon went, hold it, you forgot Oregon. And I'm in Colorado, and our state went to you guys and went, hey, we want wolves in Colorado. Well, New England said the same thing, and they went, hey, we want wolves in New England. But the agency said, well, we got wolves in the Rockies, we've mm -hmm. done our job. Well, two judges have now opened up the case, and they said, no, we must consider both getting wolves in other states out west, and a new judge just recently said, we must consider getting wolves back into New England. And the unique thing about New England is you're waterlocked. You have habitat all across Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine. You have habitat, Baxter State Park, the Adirondack State Park. Uh, Maggie was just up visiting both of those and doing yeah, educational programs in that area. You have more deer than almost any other area. And the coyotes are getting huge. Why? Because the wolves are gone. Yep. The coyotes are packing together, and they've learned to catch deer. So it's taken 50 Ooh. to 100 years without the wolves for the coyotes to take over that job. But now you have moose making a comeback all the way across Ooh. New England that to wait for those little coyotes to get big enough to catch a moose, the moose are going to eat New England out of house and home. So that's why all of a sudden New England is prime candidate for wolf recovery. Um, but to get wolves back here, people are going to have to do it. You've got too much water between Canada and New England for wolves to come back on their own. And of course, like when, Minnesota, where they yeah, just unlike Minnesota, the wolves just migrated back in Montana. Uh, we all argued about Yellowstone. We're all working hard. Let's get some wolves to Yellowstone. Twenty-two years we worked, and in those twenty-two years, to get fifteen wolves to Yellowstone, a hundred wolves walked back to Montana on their own. <laughs> So they're starting to catch on that there is prey base now. You've got to remember, 100 years ago, we hardly had any deer. We hardly had any elk. We hardly had any moose. You know, after Lewis and Clark showed up and said that's an unexhaustible supply of bison, right. we killed most of the, the prey animals. And that left predators in the world of hurt 100 years ago. And not only were predators in a world of hurt because all their prey had been killed, but then we put domestic animals in their place, cows and sheep. And so the predators just had a heyday on our domestic livestock, yeah. and that's when we came up and said, all right, we better kill the predators. Today things have changed. We have deer, we have elk, we have moose, more than we've ever had even when Lewis and Clark arrived. Plenty of food for wolves, and people are now learning that wolves uh, make the fish healthy, that wolves kill coyotes. A lot of people aren't very happy with coyotes in the cities because they're killing small animals. Uh, and with the wolf back, the coyote population is dropping. Uh, the grizzly bear population has actually made a little resurgence because wolves may be providing little food for the grizzlies. So uh, we say that to take the wolf out of the forest is like taking the water out of a river. You still have the stream bed and everything's there, but nothing moves. Right. And when the wolf is moving down that stream like the water, then everything can go forward. But without the wolf, you might as well have a stream without water. 
Yeah, I mean, you used a, 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 a term ecologist used trophic cascade, but mm -hmm. that really did catch a lot of us by surprise. I mean, we suspected wolves would increase uh, the health of, of elk herds mm -hmm. and deer herds and so on, but the idea that it could have an effect on the botany and the fresh water, I think everybody was... was it is very surprised and, and yeah. for once pleasantly so. Uh -huh. The willows came back and, and all these other... We saw the researchers and the biologists that went and put wolves in Yellowstone, all right, we got about three to five years and then we're going to be out of work and we'll have learned it all. And the reality of it is there are new groups every year that open up a new study. Uh, there are students that will go study a carcass of an elk now that a wolf caught. And they won't go study the wolf, they study that carcass. They are learning that sometimes upwards of 180 different species get food. Wow. The, where before, the elk would just die. Nothing could eat it because it would just rot. There was nothing to open it up. And now with the wolves opening the carcass, they get the prime food, they go off, find another sick elk, and the coyotes, and the bears, and the birds, and the squirrels. Um, boy, she's just singing away here today. Well, Maggie's reminding me, I've, I've had a great time conversing with you and asking questions, but this is a live broadcast, so if, if people in the audience would like to uh, tune in and, and call in a question for, for either Kent or Tracy or, or Maggie, um, we'll attempt to answer it, so we, we'll put the number up, but if you have any questions about wolves, please do call in. I, I Maggie's asking you guys to uh, call in and give her some input. <laughs> She's wow. giving you the phone number. Yeah. It'd be really interesting for people to try to give us some guesses on how much she weighs. We find everybody thinks wolves are so big and so bad. Um, this, by the way, is what we call a gray wolf. <laughs> a lot of people hear the term Arctic wolf and tundra wolf and right. timber, timber wolf, wolf and Mexican <laughs> wolf. Those are all gray wolves. They're just nicknames. And the Arctic wolf, of course, lives where it's white. If you were a black wolf in the Arctic, you wouldn't be very happy. It'd be hard to catch food, and there are black wolves that live up there, but they're rare. Mm -hmm. If you were a wolf that lived in a dark forest, i.e. a timber wolf, you would hope maybe be a darker color to live in that environment. And if you were a wolf that lived on a desert, say the very rare Mexican gray wolf, they're actually brown in color. They're not gray. Wow. But uh, these are what we call gray wolves. Um, we have a call in. Oh, we have a we have a question. Okay. Can't we'll yeah. uh, we'll Go listen ahead. to the questioner. Hi. Um, you had mentioned in your speech earlier that the wolves have like webbed um, skin between their toes. Is that to make them better swimmers, or is there, or is that for um, to make their feet more like snowshoes in the snow? I would say probably the second, more just to survive. I find in mud, uh, they can spread that foot out and they just walk across the mud. If I step in it, I'm up to my knee and I'm trying to get my boot out of the mud. Um, and Tracy might be able to, I don't know She's if that camera right can now. show, that paw can spread out almost, you can see, wider than the, the palm of her hand. Um, as far as swimming, we have found that wolves are incredible swimmers. She loves to play in the water, and although this wolf is more specific, I like to wade, I'm a little scared of getting too wet, <laughs> right. it's kind of funny. Um, we've had many wolves that will just jump right into a rapid. She'll jump right into a rapid in a river and swim, but she's afraid of the ocean waves moving and the lake waves moving. The, the noise and the crash of the waves kind of scare her, which is interesting. But there have been reports of some biologists in the western coast of British Columbia of a specific wolf area where the wolves swim almost eight miles into the ocean. They actually eat wow. salmon and to see wolves swimming out in the ocean, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to be yeah. in a boat someday a few miles out in the ocean there goes a pack of wolves swimming by you. But they're <laughs> incredible swimmers and yes, I've watched those web feet when they do swim, uh, very much helps them. And, and I have one other question. On, on your compound in Colorado where you have about 30 acres and, and you said that you feed the wolves, um, a lot of the ranchers give you um, their cows that have died and everything. Do the wolves also hunt on their own in that 30 acres? Yeah, if I had 10,000 acres and I could put a herd of deer and the wolf could catch the sick deer and the healthy deer could get away, then that would probably be fair both to the prey and the predator. And we don't have that kind of space available. So almost all the food they eat is food that we've brought in. It's natural food, but it's already dead. Uh, my example is that if I put in the healthiest rabbit I could find in the forest, that rabbit could outrun or outwit a coyote or a wolf or a fox. But that rabbit inside a fenced enclosure, no matter how fast, how quick, how sharp it is, 
would not have a chance. And what's interesting is we find that if an animal runs at Maggie, she runs away. If the animal runs away from her, she chases it. So to provide a natural prey situation is just not effective. We don't have the money or the fence. And yet there are enough space and enough habitat that there are some very foolish squirrels or brave ones, if you want to call it that, <laughs> that will go in and try to steal leftover food. We've had wolves catch many birds, and we had a wolf that would go put its meat beside the fence, hide under a tree a ways, and wait until a bird came in and started pecking on the meat. The wolf couldn't catch the bird, but it could jump up and hit the bird with its paw and knock it into the fence, and thus catch the bird. The wolf caught three birds in one hour. <laughs> and so, yeah, they can get very adept at hunting, but again, any animal in a caged environment is so different than the wild that we don't want to compare that to a wild wolf. What we simply like to do is just give her a nice sanctuary. And uh, yeah, if I could provide her a hunting ability, I would, but unfortunately we can't. Thank you very much. Uh huh. We'd like to remind folks, uh, if you're calling from a, a field station, please use the 1-800 number. If you're watching here, you're a student or employee at NCTC, you can call at uh, extension 7999. So please do give us a call. Uh, with any questions you might have. Uh, now, Maggie is, is, looks to be sleeping. Uh, yes. Apparently, we've bored her uh, uh, <laughs> into a coma. It's, it's very direct communication. You know, we'll <laughs> sit around, and you and I can sit around and talk all day. And, you know, yeah, we get some information out, but do we achieve anything from a wolf viewpoint? No. <laughs> she came in here for a purpose. She said hello. You can see she greeted us, got yes. to see who things are. She had her song, and now that is it. I have done my job. I don't need to talk. I could pet her a minute ago, but if I sat down and started petting her, she's going to look at me like, we already said hello. What is your problem? She's going to get up and lay over again. If I keep touching her, she's going to bare her teeth and go, don't touch. And so the point is, wild animals aren't something we should touch. They don't like to be touched, but it's all purpose-oriented. Um, most of the wolves in Yellowstone right now, Mark, they're sleeping. They're sleeping. They have been known to sleep 18 hours in a day after eating a huge meal. And they spend a good part of their day sleeping, but they move when their prey moves. So morning hours, evening hours, they're probably the most active. I see. Yeah. We've been talking a little about food. Um, since you don't have prey mm -hmm. regularly in your enclosure with the odd suicidal yep. bird, uh, notwithstanding, what do you feed your wolves at Michigan? Um, the best food that a wolf can eat, you know, being the wild or captive, is this natural prey, deer and elk. That's what they're designed to eat. Mm -hmm. um, so we, of course, get roadkill deer and elk. Uh, we can't find enough, though. Out here, man, you have so many roadkill. <laughs> if we could get your roadkill from New England back to Colorado, we would have plenty. And it just shows that you guys are starting to get to that point. What do we do without predators? Um, you're going to have some problems. You've got chronic wasting disease, uh, which going through the deer can really be uh, fatal to them. But uh, at the refuge, believe it or not, we get 80% of our food from the local ranchers. Wow. And to say that ranchers and wolves live together, the TV and the media tends to find the most honorious tree hugger and the most obnoxious rancher, and they get those two in a fight and they record it and they put it on the TV. I grew up in a family of ranchers. We know that if you're having trouble with predator, it's your fault as a rancher in your husbandry. And so, so many of the ranchers in our area are true ranchers. They're ma families that live and have lived on the land for years. They know if they leave a dead cow in, in the field, they're going to have predators, mountain lions, bears, right. bobcats, coyotes, and they're going to shoot them. But they've also learned if you take responsible care of your dead animals, don't leave them lay in the field. It's a real easy solution. The predators leave the ranchers alone, and now the ranchers are driving out of their way to bring their family with their dead livestock to feed the wolves. That's great. So 80% of our food is all raw, fresh meat, uh, but it is, unfortunately, from ranchers. And again, this is the excess or expired livestock that the ranchers just have a hard time disposing of. So it's turned into symbiotic. Uh, it helps the ranchers in our area, and in return, it keeps the coyotes out of the ranchers' fields. That's great. Yeah. You know, I have to do a political plug here. <laughs> we uh, started a, a partnership program with ranchers for mm -hmm. precisely the reason you said, to try to get some more interaction and, and yep. seeing um, wildlife from, from both perspectives. It's called Walk a Mile in My Boots, which is kind of an evocative thing. But just mm -hmm. yesterday, uh, we had a rancher here who had one of the last remaining um, populations of black-footed ferrets on his ranch yep. and really helped uh, you know save that species mm -hmm. when it was on the precipice so it uh, yep. you know, they really um, do know the wildlife and, and in many cases 
our, our critical allies. That's that was what, a nice example you gave. That's what I have found. I watched, I've taken these wolves to Yellowstone National Park for over a decade, mm -hmm. working. We sat down with ranchers and hunters and trappers and loggers and miners and wolf lovers and wolf haters. And you get 20 people around the table, it's not an easy discussion. People lay personal compromises on the table. They made a plan, but that doesn't get reported. Outside the you know state room where everybody's making their compromises is where you have the two obnoxious ones fighting, and that unfortunately misrepresents both the tree hugger and the rancher. But uh, we have found that probably some of the best environmentalists are ranchers, and I know many ranchers that have had wolves on their ranch. Well, there's a compensation program that Defenders of Wildlife offers, yep. where they will compensate a rancher if a wolf comes in and eats a cow or a sheep. Well, it means two things. One, the rancher has to know where his cow is. Because if the cow dies and it's eaten and he comes out and finds a pile of bones, he can't really prove that wolf ate it. Right. Um, so it means that the mom and pa ranchers that are in touch with their animals, they can get compensated. I had a rancher hop in the bus with Maggie, look at her, and couldn't believe that his neighbor rancher had been paid money because wolves ate his cows. And the neighbor rancher said, the wolves can come back to my ranch any day. It didn't cause me any problems. I got compensated when I did, and actually I got more money than if I took the cows to, mar to, to market. And the guy called his neighbor a liar. And he got on the bus, and I was like, no, this is how it works. And what it is is it's a band-aid, but it's helped ranchers recognize if they are responsible with their livestock, they have very little predator problems. Right. The ranchers that seem to be irresponsible with their uh, livestock are the corporations. It's easier for them to hire somebody to go out and kill the predators than it is to hire enough cowboys to watch 3,000 head of livestock. Okay. Most mom and pa ranchers, 500 head is most they run. Earlier, since we have Maggie here and we're talking about uh, um, the Ambassador Wolf Program, mm -hmm. you, you said one of the reasons you go out to like school groups or here um, is to overcome misperceptions about wolves. What, what are some of the misperceptions that the general public may have? Well, about it, you know, wolf? 20 years ago, you couldn't find a picture of a wolf, and if you said wolf, people would do it disgust. And wolf mm -hmm. was the devil, the vermin, the evil. And in the last 20 to 30 years, as not only wild wolves have made a comeback, but people have recognized we got to stop clear cutting and polluting our rivers and our air. I mean, there's a huge movement, and it's not just about saving the pretty animals. This is about saving ourselves. Um, that we've now kind of come across to a point where um, people are now on the other side of life in America. If I like it, go buy it. <laughs> and people are watching the wolf movies on TV. Yeah. And then they go home after school or after work, and somebody comes up with this little beautiful puppy, and they go, here, Mark, take this puppy home. Right. You can raise a wolf, and, you know, it's illegal to have a wolf. So what they'll do is they'll lie, and they'll say it's part dog. And we now have people that breed a wolf with a dog in a cage, and they think the puppies are going to look like a wolf and act like a dog. Of course, <laughs> that doesn't work very well. Sometimes it does, but most of the animals suffer. So today, I'm faced with talking to 50,000 people a year who are never going to see a wild wolf. They're never going to go to Yellowstone. They're so stuck in their environments, but someday they're going to walk out of school and somebody's going to put a wild animal in their lap and say, take it home, raise it as a pet, $500, please. And our goal is to get those people with common sense to go, wild animals hate living in houses. I'm not a jailer to a wild animal. No, I'm not going to buy it. So today, most of Mission Wolf's work is reaching people with the message that wild is in the woods, domestic's in my backyard, and to mix wild and domestic together doesn't help wild or domestic, it just creates a problem. But we have to learn by experience. Yeah. And humans are definitely, especially Americans, we have to touch it before we believe it. So that's what we found. We can talk all day, we can show the pictures, and as I've mentioned, I've seen this many times, the teacher that brought the wolf to school or the administrator at the facility, when the wolf walks in, it's usually the teacher that gets the most timid. And it's worries because it's the teacher that fueled the program, knows wolves don't eat people, and yet the wolf looks at the teacher and she's like, <laughs> it starts hyperventilating, the wolf sniffs her on the nose, and also she's like, oh, and that two-second encounter is probably why we do this job. But it's mainly getting people over their fear, and wild is freedom. When you put it in a cage, it's not free anymore. How do the children react to the wolves? They um, same thing. Children, you know, love animals. Um, 
And what's really interesting is today we have children that uh, our family and societies aren't maybe taking care of each other as good as we used to. Uh, I used to have a lot of kids that knew their families, that knew wild animals. They had a lot of respect for people and animals. Today we have children so disrespected by adults that we're walking into facilities with 12 and 13 and 14 year old youth that have been so disrespected by adults they have no reason to trust anyone. And I don't blame them. Uh, I see the prisons and they see the detention centers and I see what they're in. You can't walk myself or you or any professional person in. The kids will just, you know, shine you on. Mm -hmm. You walk a predator into those kids. And I don't care if they're first graders, college kids, or retirees. Instantly, the whole room of first graders go, and predators teach respect. When you go into a group of teenage abused folks that have no respect for adults, they're rude, they're obnoxious, unfortunately that's what they've been taught, but the predator makes them quiet. And it's just phenomenal to me to watch that. And then I get talking to these kids, and especially the kids with a really poor behavior, they've never seen a deer in the wild. The kids that I go to in second grade and they all sit quiet, you walk in and they give you respect, the teacher didn't have to get up and introduce you, these are all kids that have seen deer or bears. And mm -hmm. so that's the comment that we see as we travel. We've now reached a million people in 30 states. We go to inner city schools in DC, in Chicago, and LA. We go to backwood schools in Kansas and Colorado and Idaho. The kids that have nature close to their school, the behavior in those schools are phenomenal. The schools that we go to where the kids have lost their connection with nature, the behavior is horrible. And so we see a complete analogy that if you want a happy future for your family, for your children, for you, take care of the nature around your community. It's, it's as simple as that. We just had a conference out here on, on something called Nature Deficit Disorder. Mm -hmm. There's a fairly popular book called Last Child in the Woods. And, mm -hmm. and that was exactly the point, uh, yep. a lack of connection to nature in any sense, mm -hmm. be it urban parks or, yep. or wilderness areas. Um, causes all sorts of maladies yep. from ADD to obesity and uh -huh. so on. And, and it seems like partially what you're doing is bringing a little yep. bit of nature at least into their lives, be it a gym or an auditorium yep. or something Yeah, and there's like something too that, um, you know, people, a domestic animal, we've taught them to do what we want. You know, a dog will sit there and let a kid just pat it on the head and the dog just sits there all day just getting hit. And it's not because the dog really likes it. We've taught the dog that's what we've liked. And you look into the dog and the dog looks at you like, oh, okay. And a lot of people tell you that, you know, they look in the eye of a dog and it's like nobody's home. That is what I think gets these kids because these kids that um, have been so abused, and not just children, I mean, I'm talking 60 year old kids too. They have not much hope for the future. They've been disrespected. And when the wolf comes in and looks at them, the ability of the wolf to perceive your attitude from a distance if we could explain that, I think in a hundred years, humans are going to learn some of this. But this wolf can walk in and she'll look at 30 or 40 individuals and she'll go pick out the one individual that later we will find probably had the most stressful encounter that day of anybody in the room or had their family, uh, you know, violently murdered or different things like this. It's very interesting how she can pick out that attitude. And it's something I don't know if she smells or she sears or she picks up, but we think a lot of it's body posture. And that's what we're finding is wild animals. She can look at a deer, which she actually met a deer the other day. It was at a nature park. She's on a leash, and this is a deer that's used to hundreds of visitors walking by from 20 feet, and it doesn't even run. The deer didn't know what to do with the wolf. The wolf didn't know what to do with the deer, but what was interesting, they completely mirrored each other's body posture. The deer looked at the wolf, and the wolf looked at the deer, and they both stood there like, they let out a sigh. They both turned their sides and they both just walked off and ignored each other. The deer didn't run. If it would have, the wolf would have chased. If the deer would have come at the wolf, the wolf would have run and the deer would have chased. But they both mirrored each other. Humans seem to have lost this ability to understand body posture. And I think that's where I'm hoping our society heads is going back to a point where we recognize not only can we understand animals' body postures, they can understand ours, and we can also understand other humans better by understanding animals. That's very interesting. I noticed when she was in our auditorium, we had a picture of a duck and a uh, elk and a, a fish, a salmon. Uh -huh. uh, but two or three times, she went up and looked at the picture of the mountain lion. Yep. Yep. <laughs> that, that was the only one that, that caught was, her attention for yep. some reason. I saw that. She looked that. at it, and then she walked around, and she looked at it again. And, uh -huh. uh, 
yep. and decided it was, uh, like us, a thing of little interest. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> went to bed. Oh, we have another call, Kent. Uh, okay. Let's take another question from the audience. Hi. I was curious if wolves have the same arthritic problems in their hips that, like, say, German shepherds do. Yeah, that's a, a great question. It leads into uh, when I was a child, we were told that fox terriers came from foxes, that middle-sized dogs came from coyotes, and big dogs came from wolves, like the German Shepherd. Today, they're telling us that the DNA in a chihuahua is identical to a wolf. So basically, the wolf is the answer, as you could say, of all of our domestic dogs. And basically, all a chihuahua is, is a sick wolf bred to a sick wolf that had a birth defect, funny short legs. And then we bred that to another sick wolf with funny short legs, and we enhance that birth defect. So a lot of our dogs today have debilitating problems from these birth defects, whether it be dysplasia that you see in shepherds, loads of arthritis that you see in a lot of dogs, uh, the small dogs, the pugs, the chows with their pushed-in faces, they have huge teeth problems, sinus problems. Um, other dogs have skin allergies. The wolves, we've not seen any of that with them. Uh, we've never had a wolf with dysplasia. We've had wolves live as long as 18 years old. That's wow. almost unheard of. In the wild, six years. Man, if you're a six-year-old wolf, you've done it really good. If you're in Yellowstone where nobody can hunt you, you might make it to eight or nine, but that's about it. And we're finding wolves at 17 and 18 years of age dying of natural causes, still without arthritis, without dysplasia, without the typical dog problems, but what we're finding I think most common occurs is their bones fuse together just like humans do. They get calcium buildup that puts pressure on the spinal cord and they start losing sensation to their rear legs. Um, so far we've not been able to find arthritis in there or dysplasia, but um, no, I think wolves are much, much healthier than most dogs. Did that answer your question, caller? Must have. Yep. <laughs> That's a good point. It actually made me think a little more about your your refuge. How many wolves do you have? Up we there have in Colorado? 36 right now. I would have 5,000 if I could <laughs> take in all the ones that need a home, and we just can't. That's why we are motivated to do this traveling. But with all these different ages and them living so long and, and coming in from different uh, locations, how do they form themselves into into packs? Ooh, that's a good point. Uh, wolves are like humans. They are usually find and look for a mate for most of their life. When they mm -hmm. do find that mate, that's their mate for their life. And for me to go find two wolves and put them in a fence together and say, have a family, works as good as me finding two people on the street and say, have a family. So that's our hardest challenge. And at the refuge, if I take in an adult wolf, very seldom can I find another adult wolf that they really like each other. Mm -hmm. But if people will give us a puppy, as in Maggie came to us at four months of age, when I put this puppy into a pen with other wolves, they adopted it. They got excited. They regurgitated food. Oh boy, we got a baby. <laughs> and because we don't let the wolves have babies, it kind of satisfied their own need to raise their young. And then it allowed the wolf to grow up in the facility. So that's kind of how we bring the wolves in. And that's why we also have 15 different enclosures because I can't always get two wolves to get along with each other. So many of our wolves are in pairs. Some of them are in small packs. We had a pack up to 11 wolves, which worked very great in captivity, but you know, we'd like to think, Mark, that you and I, when we get old, our grandkids, maybe it'd help take care of us. If you and I were a wolf, our grandkids are the ones who are going to look at us and go, hey, you old-timer, you're over the hill, you blew it on that last hunt, we're all going to starve because you're lame, you get out of here or we're going to die. And if you and I were really strong, we go, no, 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 I'm not that lame young kid, you're the one that made the noise and scared that deer away, you get out of here because I'm doing fine. So in the wild, the elder can leave, natives called it death with dignity. Uh, or the elder could say, no, I'm really strong, and the young one could leave. But in captivity, they can't, and they can injure or kill each other, which would be abnormal. So that was our job, and that's what happened to Maggie. She took over leadership of an elder female. The elder female couldn't leave the pack. Maggie would have hurt or injured, maybe even killed her, had we not removed her. Now that allows Maggie to be into our own. So, uh, yeah, playing matchmaker tools, it's not uh, an easy thing to do. And they're just as unique as humans. Um, they seek their mates just like humans. Um, they have a cycle once a year. They only mate one week a year. Their courtship goes on for three months prior to that one week of mating. And then they'll sit around in bliss for two months afterwards. And so everything's very exaggerated compared to human society. How do you support 
the refugees? Um, we put the land in the wolf's name in 1988 because we thought we'd go bankrupt and we didn't want to lose <laughs> the land. And Can you legally do that? Put and we did. We name? put the land in the wolf's name and we said this <laughs> is it. We <laughs> were told that there were foundations that would support a group like ours, so we made it a nonprofit group. And what we found is the grant writing applications was just as cutthroat as the business yes, world. Yes. And what was really interesting is we had one priority. We gave the wolf a huge fence. We had the fence built while we were still living in a tent before we built the cabin. When our federal inspector came up, went, I've never seen a place that has big fences for the animals and nothing for the people. But I can say these are some of the happiest wolves, and that has probably been our success. People came to Mission Wolf, they saw a happy wolf, and they go, wow, can I help? And we said, sure, build fence, build a cabin, build a path. Here, work on some visitor materials. Today, we have 200 acres, 30 acres fenced. Uh, the rest is in a nature center conservation. We have a small visitor building, a small community building, a small vet building, all built out of recycled materials. The refuge runs on solar power, gravity-fed water systems. It's all sustainable. And that was our goal, was to create a facility that didn't need money. So today, unfortunately, we still need money. Our liability insurance eats us up. You can imagine what it takes yeah. to have a million dollar liability policy to take wolf to school and so we still need money but what we ended up doing is we have a membership program where people feed a wolf and they get a picture of the wolf so that's how we feed them we have artwork that artists donate and that makes the land payments we're still paying off land that's a lot of money um, we have uh, a program where schools make a donation to the gas tank of the bus and that way the bus gets around the country to do the education uh, we sell some t-shirts and that fills the voids by his fence and because all the visitors and all the volunteers that come to Mission Wolf, nobody gets paid. You get some of the most qualified people that are tired of the status quo. They're very, very educated and they want to just offer something with their life. And when you get 10 people that all try to outwork each other in a day, you get people working 16 hours a day outperforming anybody in the pay for a job world. But again, they do it because they enjoy doing it. So that's how we operate the whole refuge. It's completely by volunteers. And if anybody's interested, they can go onto our website. They can learn about whether it be come and visit, see the wolves, if they want to volunteer for an hour or a day. Uh, if you put in two months, we'll give you a teepee to sleep in. A <laughs> and that's how I've got people at the refuge I've right now. Seen the teepees, they look so very I nice. So I can be here. Yes. <laughs> very primitive structures, but they're very, very efficient and they do a great job. Do you oftentimes get visitors that stay for, for a Yes, the months? average visitor that comes in for an hour spends two days. If you come for two days, you'll be there for a week. Uh, I have a couple people there right now. One came in for a month. They're there for over a year right now. Uh, one came in for two months. She's been there for almost five years. Uh, so it's very addictive. But at some point, the sad part is way out in the woods, there's no money. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody, unfortunately, in this world still needs to have some money. So. Unless you're independently wealthy, you can come live there the rest of your life. If you're not, usually people after two to five years, they have to go back to the reality. Uh, nice teepee, I got some good food, but I still have a life and I need some money. Sure. Yeah. But, uh, but that was the goal, and I think that's one of the most beautiful things we have at Mission Wolf is we've left it to where you don't have to be accredited, you don't have to have education, you don't have to have money. All you have to do is have motivation. Uh, I have had 12-year-old girls camp out for two weeks, and they did more work than all of the college volunteers. And I've had I've got a 65-year-old Air Force nurse that uh, is retired that's up there working at the Wolves right now. That's great. Yeah. So and the other uh, benefit is they get to hear the wolves howl. Yes. Yep. <laughs> they like get to hear the today. wolves howl, and and that's like you saw. You know, we all want Maggie to hang out with us. She came up and said right. hi to what thirty Before, seconds, yeah. maybe a minute, and now she's going to lay there. And as long as we sit there and watch her, we can watch her sleep. <laughs> that's the same thing at the staff and the refuges. Wild animals don't want to be touched by people. And Mission Wolf is in a business for one to teach people why you shouldn't have a wolf in a TV studio on a leash. Yep. And uh, the day that we don't have to have wolf in the TV studio on a leash to teach people about wolves is the day that we have wolves in New England and people here in New England can go up to the Adirondacks, to Baxter or even other areas and hear that wolf howl not in a TV studio. That would, that would be our, our vision of success.
Oh, it sounds like you're pretty much at capacity at your particular refuge for wolves. Yes. What happens to people now um, who have pets that, that can no longer handle you them? You know, as like my opening comment, I mentioned there's more wolves in cages than live in the wild. Mm -hmm. Most of those wolves sadly end up dead at the age of two years. But you do have wolf sanctuaries in virtually every state. They're usually run by volunteers. Uh, if you want to get involved, go look online. You can probably find one of them and go volunteer. Or donate some money, become a member. Um, but there's a lot of captive wolf facilities. To the ones that I can't take, I call the place in Seattle, Washington, Wolf Haven, they can't take them. They call the place in Indiana, they can't take them. They call the other place in Texas, they can't take them. And so I've just come to the point as either be responsible, keep the animal, or be responsible and kill the animal. I've told that to 5,000 people, mm -hmm. and I don't like doing that. But that would be our job, is to teach people someday that wolves are in the forest, not in a cage. But uh, right now it's tragic. Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, now, we haven't actually talked as much about what, what your lifestyle is like. Uh, you're actually traveling around in a bus <laughs> with, 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 with Maggie, yep. the, the three of you. And, and uh, a natural question uh -huh. is, how does Maggie how like to, traveling? Yep. <laughs> it's um, kind of like a, a well, predator yeah. partridge family thing. It yeah, like what, there what we ended up doing was we moved far away from it to get away from money and to get the wolves away from people. Right. Well, that made the wolves so happy that in the process of rescuing wolves from places, we started learning how to travel and transport them. Mm -hmm. And now what we found is that not only does it help wild wolf recovery so much, but most people's experiences, they have to touch it to believe it. And yeah. with so many animals for sale today, that's why we do this. But Maggie is one of the only ones of 36 right now that if we rattle her leash, she thinks it's fun. You can see she walked in here on a soft leash. She has actually been in both oceans. She's been at the Grand Canyon every morning. This morning she was here at the training conservation center, but she woke up howling. We got her on a leash. She ran outside, and she doesn't want to run for freedom. She'd only run to chase an animal for food. She trots at about two to five miles an hour right with us and stops at every smell. And she gets so much stimulus from smelling all the squirrels, the ducks. A couple days ago, I mentioned we saw a deer. Uh, she got up really close to some ducks, and the ducks had left their mess right on the ground. And of course, as dogs love to roll and stuff, Maggie's upside down <laughs> rolling all over in the duck stuff. And she just loves it. Uh, she's scared of the ocean. You know, the waves splash, and it chases her up the beach, but then the waves run away, and so she chases them. And then the waves, and if you think about it, that is so much stimulus for her yeah. that she thrives on this. And then today we brought her in front of an audience of, oh, maybe, you know, 70 or 80 people. You would think bringing a wild animal into a room with 70 or 80 people, the animal would just be shaking and horrified, which most of them are. But as you saw today, Maggie walked in, look at me. She walked around, said hi to the people, and that's what we find is some of her happiest times in her day are getting ready to walk into 500 people. Um, and the best way I can say it is we've had people from all over the world that have come to Mission Wolf. We have, you know, biologists, we get, you know, educators, we get politicians, we get street people. Everybody has something to say about wolf. But one day we had a, a lady from India come. She studied with the Dalai Lama. She was very strong into Buddhism. And they said what goes around comes around, or karma. And she said, this wolf has better karma than the poor wild wolf. Well, we looked at her in horror and went, no, 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 this wolf's not free. And she's like, no, you just said it does not get chased and shot. It will live twice as long as the wild wolf. She said it showed this fence. She was at the refuge, and she saw the wolves in this nice fence protecting it. The wolf had so much food, it couldn't eat it all. And the birds were sitting there pecking away at the food, and the wolf didn't even bother to guard the food. She said to have more food than you can eat, that is a great honor in life. That's really good karma. And then we said, but, but. This wolf can never run free. It's really sad. This wolf should run 50 miles a day, and she'd be able to run, you know, through the forest and enjoy freedom. She's like, the wolves don't run 50 miles a day because they want to. They're doing it because they have to survive. No, no, no. You Americans do not understand freedom. This wolf is much more free to survive, and one of the highest honors in life is to have admirers. This wolf has more admirers than almost any other person I know. She has a very good life. So. Do we want wolves in cages? No, I don't. But to answer your question, as long as Maggie is stimulated and enjoys doing this, that's what makes audiences so receptive to our program. Uh, if I drug Maggie into your conference today and I was pulling her on a leash and she was scared and she had her tail tucked and she was pooping on the ground because she was afraid, I wouldn't have done anything except alienated the audience against me for subduing the animal. And uh, I've had some of the most 
you know, famous wolf biologists that, I mean, I revere. They're really up there. They've been out in the woods. They know what wolves are. And they usually see wolves in captivity, and they're glazed over, and they're scared, and they're stressed. And I've had a couple of them come up to the bus, get in, and look at the wolf, and the wolf just looked in their eyes, looked through them, and they went, oh, you know, and it wasn't a tranquilized wolf. you got to remember, most of these biologists, the only way they get close to a wolf is tranquilized. Right. And all of a sudden, that wolf was looking at them with coherent eyes. And they took that double take and that hyperventilated breath. The wolf looked them on the face, and all of a sudden, they went, oh, my God. This wolf is actually happy. I have never, ever seen this. And so that's one of my, you know, biggest compliments when somebody says that. But that's the goal, is if Maggie is ever scared, she can go home. And I don't know if you've noticed, but Maggie has her partner attached to her on the I leash. I've noticed. Um, this is my <laughs> wife, Tracy. And us guys, we can get around animals, all right, but women have this maternal instinct that allows them to get much closer. Right now, Maggie's pointed at Tracy. Yeah. And if anything scary were to happen, Tra Maggie would run behind Tracy. <clears throat> so we could not do this without us as a team. And what's interesting is, like I said, you know, you can't put on a mask to a wild animal. You can make your teacher and your parents and your kids think you're something else, but Maggie can look right through you. And for example, if me and Tracy, we live together, we've been married for 18 years, some days we're not as happy with each other as everybody gets. Well, if I get mad at Tracy, Maggie knows it. And I can't hide it from Maggie. Or if Tracy's mad at me, she's like, nope, mom and dad are mad at each other. I'm not going anywhere near either one of them. <laughs> so what it means is you have to have everything out on the table. You have to be able to resolve your conflict. Uh, you don't put a burden on them, but uh, that's what it's come down to. If it wasn't for the three of us being a pack, Maggie wouldn't tolerate this. If I'm out of the room or Tracy's out of the room, she will sing. Uh oh, where's the pack? And then when we travel, she's in the bus, and it was like last night, somebody's with her 24 hours a day simply to protect her from people. But uh, that's why she travels. The bus she travels in is very aerodynamic. It's very quiet. It yeah. runs down the highway very quietly. It's an old Greyhound bus. It's terrible on fuel consumption, uh, terrible on parts. It's got half a million miles on it. But uh, it's very safe for Maggie, and it keeps her very safe, so that's why we do it. That